When Jesus goes to a mountain and gathers his disciples together and starts to preach the crowd, we call that the Sermon on the Mount. And it is an open invitation that Jesus gives to follow him into the ways of the kingdom of God. He is all, Jesus was asked about salvation and new life and being blessed, and this is his response. If you want salvation, you want new life, you want to be blessed, here is what it looks like. Here's what to do. Last week we began with uh, the Beatitudes, those first verses, talking about how those who admit they need will receive uh, what they are asking for. Those who are bothered and get involved will be strengthened when they get up and do something about what is broken in the world. Those who submit to God's will become part of God's future. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. Uh, those who give will then be, receive and, and in doing so they'll be transformed to become uh, princes of peace, part of God's peace. This is the beginning of, of the Beatitudes, the, the beginning of of the Sermon on the Mount. You may have noticed last week there was one set of Beatitudes that we didn't get to. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Beatitudes kind of turn a corner there, don't they? Jesus is many things, but he's not naive. He does not promise anyone that uh, following him will mean you'll never catch flack. And here he pretty much flat out said, Blessed are you when you catch flack for following me. For that means you are on the path of the kingdom of God, and that's exactly how the prophets have caught flack before. Well, why did the prophets catch flack? The prophets caught flack because they stood up and said, Thus saith the Lord. They took a stand against what was wrong and took a stand for what was right. And when you do that, um, it's going to bother people. And if it turns out to be true, you know, if, if what a prophet said to be true, if it, what a prophet said it turned out to be true, then you knew it was a real prophet and, and you should pay attention to them. And if what the prophet said turned out to be false, then you knew that they were just kind of spinning the reels. I'm reminded, uh, th speaking of prophets and the way that prophets caught, catch flack, of a guy named Peter Schiff. In 2006, Peter Schiff got the nickname of Dr. Doom because he was the one in 2006 who said that uh, the economy of the uh, United States was heading, headed for a great recession and that property, pl pro property uh, prices were going to collapse. The housing market was going to collapse. And so at, in t back in 2006, he was the guy who got invited to all the economics talk shows and got told how many ways he was wrong. He was told again and again he was wrong. And for two, all of 2006 and all of 2007, he said that there was a collapse coming. And he was wrong until he was right. And then he sort of, he, he becomes sort of this economic prophet. He was proven to be true. So that uh, it's the same with, with us for following Jesus. We stand on what Jesus teaches. When we follow Jesus, you look at the results. Do the results of us following Jesus, are they true? Do they transform how they live? Do they shape us as a community so that when people see us, there, there is a, a response, right? That people see us and, and they say, yes, you're following Jesus and is changing their lives in a way that cannot be ignored. In the same way that this Dr. Doom could not be ignored. In the same way that the Old Testament prophets could not be ignored. When people follow Jesus together, it will draw a response. Or, I mean, it's just love them or hate them. Those who follow Jesus together will get a response. The worst thing is people who gather in the name of Jesus and, and there is no response. It doesn't bother anyone. It doesn't impact anyone. It doesn't change anything. This is what Jesus gets into next. He talks about how y'all are the salt of the earth. Y'all are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can it be restored? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Thinking about salt, I, I got this uh, thought to go look up ingredients in fast food restaurants. The top ten ingredients. You want to make a guess what some of them are? High fructose corn syrup, sugar, uh, xanthan gum, that's what makes all the sauces creamy. Caramel food coloring, keeps it all brown, so we, we think that it looks like a burger, and it really is a burger, at least it looks like one. Uh, MSG, that's one of the top. But, one, but the two most common ingredients in fast food uh, today, chicken and salt. 
two most common things. You're getting salty chicken if you're going to a fast food place. Salt is the crucial ingredient that makes food zesty and tasty. Jesus is telling us that we who follow him are meant to be like salt, that crucial ingredient that makes so the food work, that makes the food zesty and enjoyable. To be that crucial ingredient, the people who follow Jesus, uh, the crucial ingredient that makes families work, that make communities function, that make government work, it's the saltiness of the Christians in them that, that keep them uh, zesty and tasty and, and functional. This, you know, at this day, we, we don't really worry about not having enough salt, but there at times have been salt wars to have enough salt. I mean, we, we don't, we have salt production now. But, uh, there's something worse th than that, Jesus says. There's something worse than not having enough salt. It's when salt stops being salty. When salt loses its saltiness, what is it good for except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot? Well, what would it mean for salt to lose its saltiness? Right? Think back to the day and age when you didn't have Ziploc bags or airtight containers. What would be the problem, the risk you would have with your salt? Well, if, the, if, if the inherent, what you do with salt is salt food, what would, what would happen? This is my salt. This is my, I keep next to my stovetop. What would happen such that you would look in and say, you know, I don't think I want to use that anymore? Stuff get in it, right? Let's throw that picture, the next picture up. This is the close-up of, of my... Uh... Yeah, that's what... Reach for that, you're going to use that salt? Yeah, what's this good for now? Uh, once you get once the kids get in your salt and it gets messed up and stuff gets in your salt, what, we're in Missouri. What do we use salt for? We, we put it on ice, right? It, once salt is messed up, once salt is something is less than pure, once salt has lost its saltiness and you no longer want to put it on your food, we're in Missouri. We wait till winter, then we throw it on our stoop, and we do exactly what Jesus says: we trample it underfoot, and we hope that we don't split uh, slip in the process. That's the risk that Jesus talks about. When those who follow him when lose their saltiness. And we have seen this happen. Back in Jesus' day, the Sadducees had sold their souls to the occupying Romans. So they'd cozied up to the Romans and they'd stopped critiquing, saying, Thus saith the Lord. And so when the temple was destroyed in the 70th year A.D., the Sadducees were just cast out. The temple was destroyed and the Sadducees went with them. And, and so modern day Jews are descendants of the Pharisees because the, Pharisee, the Sadducees went poof. They were tossed out. We had a, something like that happen centuries later um, in Moscow, right? Moscow at one point was called the Third Rome. First Rome is obviously Rome. The head of Western Christianity is Rome, uh, or was for centuries. And then after the fall of Rome in the 5th century, the second Rome was... Constantinople. Over, uh, it was named by the Emperor Constantine, a very humble fellow. And after uh, Constantine fell in the 15th century, the next Rome, the next sort of head, the next place to claim to be head of the uh, of Western Christianity was Moscow. Didn't see that coming. Why? Why do we not even think about that now? Because Moscow, Eastern Orthodox Christianity. From the 15th century on, it was started out strong and vibrant, but then it cozied up to the government, to uh, the officials, to the aristocracy, and they liked having uh, privileges. They loved having privileges, and so when the privileged elite were tossed out in the revolution for oppressing the poor, guess what went with the privileged elite? 1917, the Eastern Orthodox Church was overturned along with the uh, Russian czarist uh, government. And so, again, tossed out, trampled underfoot because they had stopped saying, Thus saith the Lord. They lost their saltiness. When, the fo when we who follow Jesus, when we who follow Jesus, when the church stops catching flack, when we stop being in tension with the world around us, that means one of two things has happened. Either the world has become the kingdom of God and everything's perfect, or we've lost our saltiness. And, you know, people just don't really care, and we're getting close to being tossed away, trampled underfoot, no longer useful. Jesus goes on to, from salt to talk about light. We won't talk about light for anywhere near as long. I know you're surprised. But uh, Jesus says, Y'all are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one lights a lamp, then puts it under a basket. Instead, you put on a lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. Just as a meal without salt isn't much of a meal, you haven't set the table till you've put what on the table? 
salt. And in my case, a pepper grinder, but I might be weird. You always have, everyone always has salt on the table, right? And so if a meal without salt isn't much of a meal, a day without light isn't much of a day. What do we call a day, a day without light? Night, right? That's what, if, if a day doesn't have light, it's not a day. It, it, it's kind of essential to the very nature of being a day. There's no way to overlook having light. It, 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 in the same way that you never take a bite of food and, and have to ask someyone, is that salty? You ever find yourself doing that? Have, ever, have those words ever crossed your lips? You know, I'm not sure if this is salty. Take a bite. Right? In the same way, have you ever walked in the room and thought, hmm, are there lights on? Hey, hey can you, are there lights on? You know, no, it's just obvious, right? You know when something is salty. You know when the light is on. And if you, if you don't have salt, if you don't have light, then you're lacking what is essential. In the same way, Jesus continues, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So that, key phrase there, right? We do this so that we may be blessed, so that we might follow Jesus, but we also do this so that others may see. One of the most profound examples I, have, I know of in modern times of a so that, doing following Jesus so that others may see, happened back in 2006. You all remember the West Nickel Mines, what happened there in 2006? Amish community. It was a school shooting, right? School shooting. This fellow named Charles Roberts came into the Amish schoolhouse in the West Nickel Mines and shot 10 girls. Five of them died, and then he committed suicide, right? What happened afterwards? Well, how did the community respond? On the day of the shooting, a grandfather of one of the murdered Amish girls was heard warning some young relatives not to hate the killer, saying, we must not think evil of this man. Another Amish far farmer of that community said, he had a, the, the, of the killer, he had a mother, a wife and a soul, and now he's standing before a just God. Jack Meyer, a, number of, a member of the community won over, said, uh, I don't think there's anyone here that wants to do anything but forgive. And not only reach out to those who have suffered a loss in that way, but to reach out to the family of the man who committed these acts. A family, a spokesman of the killer, the Roberts family, said that an Amish, na Amish neighbor showed up within hours to uh, extend forgiveness to them. Amish community members visited and comfort the Roberts family widow, the parents, the parent-in-law held them while they wept. The Amish set up a charitable fund for the family of the shooter. Think about that. You lose the breadwinner of your household, what do you need most? You need money. And the Amish set up a charitable fund for the family of the person who had just killed five of their girls. About 30 members of the Amish community attended the Roberts funeral, and Marie Roberts, the widow, was one of the only outsiders invited to the victim's funerals. Marie Roberts wrote an open letter to her Amish neighbors thanking them for their forgiveness. She wrote, your love for our family has helped to provide the healing we so desperately need. Gifts you've given have touched our hearts in ways no words can describe. Your compassion has reached beyond our family, beyond our community, and is changing our world, and for this we sincerely thank you. People watch this happen afterwards, and it's kind of like salt, right? You can't deny that it was salty. It had a distinct taste to it. An entire community being able to forgive within hours a shooting like that, that's salty. People had very intense reactions. Some people saw this and were just amazed and said, that, that's impressive, that, that really is something to emulate. Others criticized them, really gave them flack. You can't, say, you know, you can't forgive someone that quickly. You can't forgive someone with, without them asking for it. You just can't forgive like that. The Amish didn't actually reply to those accusations, but I'm sure what they would have said is, um, watch us. That's what Jesus said to do. We are going to forgive. There is something deeply rooted in Amish culture about not holding a grudge. They don't hold grudges because they understand that they get in the way of the future, a better future. And so in that spirit of not holding a grudge, of learning to, looking to the future, they tore down the old school and they built a new one and they named it New Hope. That's the name of the school that stands there now, New Hope. That was a rather uh, salty response. You can't walk into the room and hear about that and be confused about whether the light is on. Right? It's a distinctive thing. When Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, this is what he is talking about. And, and one key aspect about this is that 
It's a plural that he's saying. When Jesus says, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth, it's y'all. It's unfortunate. I wish I could change this in every single Bible. It'd probably be the first thing i change. Is I would change, there are so many times in the Greek where it says y'all, and, and since we're, it, we're, we all speak and write proper English, it says you. In this situation, what the Greek says is y'all are the light of the world. Y'all are the salt of earth. Or depending on how colloquial you want to be, you could say youans, or all y'all are the salt of the earth. Right? But it is we who are gathered in the name of Jesus who are the salt of the earth. It's a communal response. Following Jesus is a team sport. No one of us can be all that salty ourselves, but brought together, we can be. All right? it, reading this passage this week, it, it leads to this question. What are we here? Right? If someone had to taste us, Milan Methodist Church, how salty would we be? Is there light from when we gather together? And one way to gauge that is to look at the intensity of the reaction from what we do. Do we practice such radically graceful ways of living together, of serving, that people respond, sometimes negatively, sometimes positively, but respond nonetheless? Or are we just another group of people having to get together on a Sunday morning and uh, just not very tasty? If, we want, if we're concerned about this, I think we go back to the beginning of... Uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Go back to what makes followers of Jesus salty. What makes followers of Jesus salty is we begin by admitting how much we need. That we are poor and we seek. And in seeking we receive the kingdom of God. That we are bothered and we get, thus get involved. We respond to the brokenness of the world and are strengthened in doing so. We are salty because we admit we submit to God's will and are part of God's future. We are salty because we hunger for something that is truly satisfying, the righteousness of God, and that is what satisfies us. We give out of the blessedness that we have been given, and in doing so we seek peace and are transformed. That's the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, and this drives us back to look at that again. And so I, I end in the same way I ended last week. If you want to be blessed, if you want to inherit salvation, if you want to go to the kingdom of God, experience that today, we read the first part of the Sermon on the Mount and see where you stand on that process and, and then take the next step. If we want to be blessed, we want what Jesus desires. If we are ready to accept Jesus' invitation to be salt and light to the world, we start on the Beatitudes and we get salty. Amen.